Hello, everybody. It's Dominic Neshi here. And today we are with Peter Ishak from Ishak's Conveyancing. What's just Ishak's? Ishak's? Ishak's. Ishak's. Yeah. Ishak's. Yeah. So, um, for a lot of you that don't know Peter, um, you should. And you're going to learn a lot about him today. He has been in this industry for 20 plus years. He's licensed um, all over Australia. He is a an off the plan specialist. And many of the the sort of property people would know you. Um, you've uh, been yeah. doing it a while. We're, we're getting out there. We've been uh, we've been around for a while now. We're getting very well known. Yeah. So um, we've been doing business together for quite a while. We have. Um, I'm, a, I'm a big supporter and believer of your business. The advice that you give is always excellent. Thank you. And I, I really appreciate you coming on the show today because, look, for a lot of you, uh, we have different shows. Some of them are a little bit more um, niche than others. Today, we're going to be talking a lot about off the plan contracts. Mm. We're going to be talking about the risks. We're going to be talking about where things can go astray. Um, and we're going to talk also about uh, not just from the client's perspective, but also the developer's perspective. Mm. I think you've got a very good insight into how the developer thinks about their contracts, mm. why some things are in there, and um, also just help clients allay a lot of their fears. Sometimes they've just got fears that they've collected from friends, family, the taxi driver, the whatever, and um, they can be unfounded. Um, we didn't match today. This is all not deliberate <laughs> in case, you know, Peter and I were both wearing white shirts we matching didn't make watches. The call. Yeah. 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 And um, for all of you that don't can't see behind the camera, Jenny's literally pulled out her notepad and book <laughs> because she's taking notes and she's very excited about buying her property too. Um, okay, enough about the, the jibber-jabber. So, you know... The, the, the genesis of today's podcast mm. was I saw a presentation that you did yes, uh, on YouTube and I thought that is amazing and I wanted to cover a lot of those topics. Um, can, before we jump into some of these points, can you just tell mm. us what is off the plan? What's yeah, an off sure. the plan contract? Well, firstly, thanks for inviting me and allowing me to be a part of this. It's, uh, it's exciting. I'm, I'm very excited. This is actually my first podcast, guys. So pretty cool. Pretty excited. Um, off the plan, basically the concept of off the plan and the idea behind off the plan is you are literally acquiring a real estate asset that is yet to be developed or constructed. Or constructed. Uh, it is something that is literally physically off the plan. So the design of the home, the approvals of the council um, have all been put together and now it's packaged in a contract of a proposed development that's going to come to pass and it's going to be built at some time in the future. That is off the plan. A lot of people think off the plan is just strata units. But off the plan is not just strata. You can have an off the plan vacant land subdivision. Uh, you can have an off the plan house and land package, dual lock, um, dual living, etc. So anything that is yet to physically be created and built is considered generally an off the plan contract. Okay. So off the plan is, is as it sounds, you're buying something off a set of plans. It's not Correct. built yet. And it can be, you know, strata title, industrial. It can be whatever. 100%. Yep. And when I watched your presentation, you distilled off the plan contracts into, uh, I think it was five key factors. Yes. The first factor for you that you felt was vitally important and it's something I talk about a, a lot is mm. time. Mm. Um, time. Time with off the plan is often different than a traditional contract. Mm. When you go to the auction, the house is there, you sign a contract. Yeah you move into it, you know, shortly after thereafter. Yeah. Off the plan is different. Can mm. you talk to us about time and how this comes into play and yeah. the relationship that this has with off the plan? Most definitely. So I guess the, the biggest aspect of it is, firstly, what is the time frame for uh, normal registered property? So something that is built and, and uh, ready to go. Well, normally it's a set time frame. Let's use residential contracts for the purpose of what we're talking about. Standard residential contract has a six-week period, give or take, that is a definitive start and a definitive finish. So 1st of May, exchange of contracts, and then on the 30th of June, settlement. That's a definitive time frame. So you know exactly when settlement is going to be. You can prepare in advance and get ready for it. With off the plan, depending on what stage of construction the plan is at, they can only give you an estimated time of when they're going to complete construction and build of the property. As a result, it's not a definitive time frame. So if we were to take something that hasn't been constructed yet, something that is literally about to start, it's going to become a hole in the ground shortly, and it's a two-year project. So the contract is not going to have a definitive date. It's simply going to have an estimated time frame of, say, 24 months 
mm-hmm. for construction and completions to take place. So that is the first aspect of off the plan. It's an estimated time frame. Um, why is that scary or why does that kind of concern people? Yeah. Well, there's, there's factors there. There's factors. There's the first aspect of it is um, what happens if there are delays associated with the time frame. Yeah, rain or, or you know, something happens in construction or the funder hasn't got – or the developer hasn't got their pre-sales or there's That's a correct. number of delays. A hundred percent. And these delays – a lot of people have a, a, the thought process that developers intentionally delay off the plan. And in my, in my strong opinion, particularly more recent times, that is very, very um, uh, incorrect. Um, developers do not want to delay construction of their products for, for a number of reasons. Firstly, let's look at us as investors. As an investor, should a delay in off the plan scare you? That's a very, very important question. As an um, investor, probably not. I'll let you answer. Yeah, but tell, as a me, ho- tell me. No, but as a homeowner, yes. I, I would be a little concerned because I've got to, I got to move, I've got to move That's my furniture, right. whatever. Excellent. As an investor, it's different. Most definitely. So I'll give you an example. I, I invest in off the plan religiously. I, I believe in it. Um, I've done it successfully, and uh, and I strongly recommend it for the right people and at the right time. Um, I love delays. All right, and that's going to sound very unusual, but I absolutely love delays, and I'll give you the reasoning why. For me personally. If I'm invested in a product that's going to be two years away, hypothetically, and I'm paying a deposit on this product, and I'm paying that deposit, it's going to go in a trust account, and we'll discuss money and payment in a moment, but that money sits in the trust account earning interest for me. Now, why do I love the delay? Well, number one, that asset is not costing me any money during the course of construction. I'm not going to draw down a mortgage. There's no mortgage. You pay your your deposit, it sits in a trust account, and then there's no loan yet drawn out from the bank. There's no loan loan drawn out from the bank. So I don't have what we call holding costs during the time of construction of that asset. We're talking about a unit development, hypothetically. Um, There's no holding cost. Uh, I'm not paying a mortgage. I'm not paying council rates. I'm not paying water rates. I'm not paying managing agents fees. I'm not paying strata levies. Uh, I'm not paying any maintenance costs. So while it's being built and hopefully appreciating in value, that's why I'm buying the asset, it's not costing me any money to hold. So from a strategic perspective, if the developer delays by six months because of whatever reason, as an investor with that kind of approach, I find that an absolute blessing in disguise. Take your time. The other thing is the developer can't change their mind. One of the fears that people have is what if the developer intentionally delays and then terminates the contract on me and goes and sells it somewhere else? And that was something that was a reality many, many years ago. But over time, with certain Supreme Court cases that have come through, that is now no longer a factor in that your contract will clearly indicate that the developer cannot do that to you. So what causes the delays is a very, very important aspect of the transaction. Why would a matter delay? So we touched on it. Bad weather is a big one. Union strikes. Um, contractors or subcontractors not arriving on time, issues to do with finances and approvals being provided during the stage of construction. These are all practical things that could cause a project to delay. But let's look at the developer and ask, why would a developer not want to delay? And that's my point. Developers definitely, definitely do not want to delay construction. Can you Mm. have an idea? Can you have a guess why they wouldn't want to delay? Well, if you're a developer and let's just assume you own the land, mm. which a lot of them don't, mm. let's assume they've got the debt on that land. That's right. Let's say you've got $10 million worth of debt with Westpac. Mm-hmm. You're paying interest. That's right. Number one. Yep. Um, let's just say uh, you've got other investors in the deal, mm. mezzanine finance and, 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 and alike. Mm. They're accumulating interest, and the interest they pay to those funders is a lot higher most, than to most definitely to Westpac. Mm. So I think it's in their best interest not to delay because it breaks the feasibility. A hundred percent, and that's spot on, Dom. So um, unlike us as an investor, they do have holding costs, some more than others, depending on the financial capacity and position of the developer. One of them is the finance. Another, of course, that all of them have to pay. Well, they've got to continue to pay the rent, land rates. They've got to pay their contractors, subcontractors, and tradies. They've got to pay for the machinery hire. They've got to pay um, uh, all other costs associated with holding onto the asset. So let's use an example and say you're buying an apartment for 600000 And yep. that apartment is basically going to be two years away. The developers are already factored in the profit margin they're making out of that six hundred. But that profit margin is factored in based on a time period of holding cost. Now, if that holding time period is exacerbated by 
six months, 12 months, 18 months. Well, that's an extra period of time that the developer has to pay the ongoing holding cost during that period, and that's going to eat into their profit margin. Thus, it is completely imperative for a developer to finish as quickly as possible. In fact, try and finish quicker in order to capitalize on as much profit as they can. So in summary for that point, um, do not feel that a developer intentionally delays construction, but at the same time, don't fear delays. Uh, they could actually uh, inevitably work quite advantageous for you in the right circumstances. Especially in a market like this, when you're seeing the news, you know, 10%, 15%, 20% price growth, and you hear from the developer, hey, we're going to be delayed three months, six mm. months. 100%. Thank you 100%. very much. Take 12 months. Take all your good. time. Take, Take your, your time. time. I'll just get my finances ready. It's all good. 100%. You and can you pay the holding what? costs. I'll actually add something because some question will arise and it's a valid question. But Pete, if I delay and uh, or if the development delays, I'm missing out on tax offset. I'm missing out on depreciation. True. Because I can't claim that depreciation. There's two aspects to that. If you're buying a project that's say 12, 18 months away, Perhaps it's not the right type of project for an immediate depreciation if you need it today. Maybe you need something three months away mm. or two months or immediately ready to go. So the first thing is tax offset, depending on that circumstance, is not required at that point in time. It's not something that you're buying a project two years away to achieve today. But the second aspect of it, let's say you are buying something that's only three months away because you need an immediate tax offset. You're paying a huge amount in tax and you need the depreciation. If you were to get your accountant to work out your appreciation of the asset at no holding cost while it's being delayed versus whatever potential tax depreciation that you may make, you will find more often than not that you are still better with the former rather than the latter. An asset that's not appreciate, or the asset that's appreciating value not costing you any money, at the end of the day, that is maximum gain. Tax offset is tax offset. It's claimed at a loss nonetheless. There are benefits out of it. So from a tax perspective, if you're concerned that a delay is going to affect your benefit from a tax offset, do really look into the savings you'll make while that asset is being built and it's not costing you any holding costs. Can I ask you, uh, this is a little bit of a side, a bit of an aside, and I'm not sure if we're going to address it down the, down the road, mm. but um, one thing that comes up is, you know, what's the maximum time that a developer can take? And mm. I often point to a, a sunset clause or a sunset date. Yeah. And what does that mean? The inevitable sunset date. Okay. Um, sunset dates is basically a time frame that allows the developer to extend to beyond the time that they've promised for you to have the property built. So let's use an example. Uh, you're buying a property that's ready to, should be completed in 12 months. Mm. The estimated completion time is 12 months. The sunset date will be an additional period to that to allow for potential delays. So it could perhaps... Uh, perhaps be 18 months in the contract as a sunset date. What does it mean? It means that if the developer cannot have the property built within the 12 months period, they are legally allowed under the terms of the contract to have an extension of time to finalize the construction. Now, why is it in the contracts? And why is it important? And, and what does it mean? Mm. Um, the first reason sunset dates are in the contract is because like us, we expect that bad weather and union strikes and so on could delay the construction. Well, the developer expects that as well. And the developer wants to make sure that they're entering into a sound contract with you as the investor. So it's very important for them to be able to finalize or have the ability to finalize construction if they do face issues with weather, unions, councils, etc. And that's what the purpose of the sunset date is. But there's another reason. A lot of people think the sunset date is enforced only by the developer. Far from it. No. All right. If the developer is getting funding, the bank that's lending the developer money for construction has certain regulations of how they want these contracts structured. And one of those banks, uh, one of those regulations is the bank's legal team will insist on a sunset date in the contract to protect their interest in lending the money to the developer. So it's, it's for the benefit of all parties. The sunset dates do scare a lot of people because sometimes they're very, very extensive. Mm. In, in some cases, some sunset dates will be an extra 12 or perhaps 18 months on top of the actual completed date. But you've got to put that in perspective to what our first point was, and that is it is not the intention, nor is it commercially beneficial to the developer mm. to delay construction. But at the same time, they want to factor in potential delays, and that's why the sunset dates come in these contracts. So it's not uncommon for the developer to have a sunset date which is about 
double the length of the build time. That's generally pretty standard. Um, and and to all the listeners out there, the developer more or less gets a contract given to them by their funder. So ANZ, Westpac, CBA, these are the major institutions will give them finance on the premise that they can get so many qualifying pre-sales and a qualifying pre-sale needs to be signing to all of the bank terms first and then the developer can add whatever other terms mm. that they want after that. Yep, correct. And that's by negotiation. And sometimes what we try and do is we try and negotiate the sunset date logically. So if there's a property that is a 12 months contract, but construction started, um, it's getting close to being physically completed and yet the contract still reads a 24 month sunset date, at that point we have some form of ability to negotiate with the developer and say, listen, you've almost finished construction, yet your contract still reads a 24 month sunset date. Can we make this a little bit more realistic and bring it down to six months or 12 months? Our ability to negotiate will really depend on how far the project's transpired, but it ultimately lies with the developers incoming bank. Um, they really dictate that very strongly. If construction hasn't commenced, generally speaking, the sunset date is, is very, um, very difficult to have it negotiated because of the reasons that we've just mentioned and that the bank insists on that to ensure that these contracts are sound uh, to allow the construction funding. So let's talk about the worst case scenario. Mm. Let's talk about the question that I cop most from our clients and that is around security mm. um, and the security of their deposit, the, 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 in the instance that neither developer goes bankrupt or you know, where does their money go? Does it go into the developer's bank account? How, how, let's talk about security and what kind of security the client has with their mm. money and, and then let's talk about those worst case scenarios. What happens? Yeah, most definitely. Uh, you're right, Dom. It's the number one concern besides time um, that that clients have. Um, security is really um, structured correctly depending on the format of your contract. Um, off the plan acquisitions um, are extremely safe. They uh, sometimes get given a bad name around the water cooler or the barbecue conversations. Um, but if structured correctly, they are very safe. So what happens to your deposit? Let's use our example of a $600,000 acquisition and say the deposit is 10%. Firstly, where does that deposit go? The deposit goes into the developer's solicitor's trust account. And in fact, we as a firm insist on that, that the deposit gets held with the developer's solicitor's trust account. What does that achieve? Sometimes the agent solicitor's trust account. Or the agent solicitor's trust account, which is, which is also just as effective and just as safe. So either the, the, um, the developer's agent or the developer's solicitor's trust account. In essence, it's got to sit in trust. Now, what does that achieve? It achieves 100% security. And let me explain that in, in a lot of detail. It's a very important point. If your money is sitting in trust and anything happens along the way that is unexpected, for example, the developer is to go into bankruptcy, liquidation, um, the project doesn't proceed for whatever reason, various approvals don't come through, regulations with the local council all of a sudden completely change and there's an issue, any other matter that stops construction from going ahead, the deposit sitting in trust simply means that that money is fully refundable to you, along with any interest earned on that money, no questions asked, no exposure. Now, let's elaborate a little bit more. Why is that safe? Well, it's safe because when the money is sitting in trust, it is not exposed to the developer. It doesn't go into the developer's personal account, nor if, for example, exposed to creditors or debtors of the developer if the developer is to go into bankruptcy. So if anybody was to come after the developer and say, this particular developer owes us money, the money sitting in trust does not belong to the developer. It's your money and it's 100% protected under the trust regulations. Um, this is a little point here where I'm going to plug our, our, our business a little bit. So we're very proud to say that as of January this year, we've done over 4,000 off the plan transactions. Wow. All right. Now, that's not the exciting part. This is where I really give my team and myself a pat on the back. And this is to give you comfort that the system works. Mm. If you insist that the deposit sits in trust, zero of our clients, I repeat, zero of our clients have ever lost deposit as a result of the developer going into bankruptcy or liquidation out of those 4,000. And that's something, we're, of course, we're very proud of, Dom, but that goes to show that the rule is very simple. 
if you insist and stick to the standard policies and standard course of action that we do, if your money's sitting in trust, you've got no exposure whatsoever. And I'll take that a step further as well. One person may ask, what happens if the solicitor or the agent goes into bankruptcy? The money's sitting in their trust. Yep. All right. Um, now, the answer to that is very simple. A solicitor, let's use that example, has two accounts. They've got an office account for normal office activity and they've got a trust account to hold money on behalf of clients under certain trust regulations of the law society, etc. If anything was to happen to the solicitor, um, the office account, of course, is what is up for grabs, whereas the trust account is an independent account that holds your money and your money is 100% protected even against any loss or suffering that the solicitor may expose. So in short, your money sitting in trust is 100% protected, zero exposure, and get some comfort from that. So what's stopping people from playing with trust accounts? <laughs> I, I asked that loaded, I'm smiling, because yeah. we have a trust account, and yes. yeah, we take that very, very seriously, but what's stopping people from just yeah, dabbling? Very, very, very good question. So two parts to it. A, Nothing with the exception of law, integrity, and severe consequences. Um, uh, it's a Jail criminal time. act. It's a criminal act, yeah. But then again, um, well, that's what stopped them. So integrity and, and, and consequences. But the question is, does it stop everyone? Well, no. There are instances where people do double. So then that takes me back to the point, well, how safe is my money, Peter? You're saying it's sitting in trust, it's safe. What if, you know, um, someone comes along and plays with the money? Now... What's important there is something called professional indemnity insurance and trust insurances that are in place. Every solicitor has to have certain types of insurances in place, and one of those insurances is called professional indemnity. What a lot of people don't realise is professional indemnity doesn't just cover one aspect of a law firm or a conveyancing practice. One of those aspects of professional indemnity is to provide security for money sitting in trust. So uh, I'll use myself as an example. If I'm naughty and I play with my trust account, my professional indemnity, of course, will have consequences, severe consequences for me. But you as a client, if your money is sitting in trust, are completely covered by that professional indemnity as a result of my practice. So again, to go to the nth degree, and if something of that nature happens, you are as a client 100% protected with zero exposure if your money is sitting in a trust account. Let me add one last thing to trust accounts, not to just, you know, to harp on, but... Mm. There were some instances where some developers did touch, touch trust money, mm. but in that uh, situation, the clients had signed over the rights to do that, and that's mm. why we say to clients, you do not release your deposit. You don't hundred percent. You do not release your deposit if you didn't mm. hear it the first time. Mm. So some developers were offering clients um, an interest rate mm. on that money if they release the deposit. Um, there was a big blowback after that. Mm. I, I don't know if you heard about yeah, it all. Yeah, um, So that was a big issue. So if you're listening, do not release your deposit. A hundred percent. And you know what? It's a very good point. Um, just as well as interest, also incentives. First time investor, mum and dad, buying a property for 600, paying 60,000. Now developer comes, knocks on the door and says, Mr. and Mrs. Jones, I want your 60,000 so I can pay for... Um, tradies, machinery hire, um, council contributions. If you release the money to me, which you have to pay anyway, I will give you $10,000 off the price. Now, as an investor, as a first-time investor, that's a lot of money for everybody. $10,000 is a massive saving. So people begin to rationalize and justify, Pete, hold on, if we release the money, we're going to get 10 grand off. Mm. Now, we're going to pay the deposit anyway. It's, uh, it's not refundable anyway, but now we can benefit and make that 10000 Yes, you can. But the potential consequence is rather serious. The potential consequence is for you to save that 10000 if something like what Dom has said happens and something happens with that developer, although legally you're entitled to pursue the developer for your money, but practically how difficult is it to recover the money if it's spent? Your money's gone. Your money's gone. So do not fall for incentives. Uh, do not um, rationalise doing things that will affect your risk mitigation out of the question, leave the money in trust, don't worry about any incentives. In fact, I am very, very serious about this point to that if we get situations where the developer insists on the release, we are very, very cautious in explaining this to the client. And in some instances, if the client does not come to realization with our advice, we actually will choose not to act. Uh, that's how serious we are 
on trust money. So your money is very, very important. Our job is to protect it, keep it in trust. So that leads me to the next point. Um, this is a point that comes up a lot, especially coming out of the 2017-18 boom, mm. we saw a lot of construction issues. There was a lot of new entrants, there's a lot of new tradies, there's a lot of new developers. New people make pro- uh, mm. make mistakes. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, and the, the question that I want to ask you or talk to you about is variations. Because mm. if I'm buying something off the plan, I expect to get what I had purchased. Right. Yeah. So what happens if there is a variation to, you know, the plans that I've got inside my contract? Mm. Um, what kind of obligations does a developer have to those marketing plans? Can there be variations? What does that look like? Because I understand that since there was a whole heap of issues, contracts have gotten more severe and mm. harder for developers. Mm. Yeah, this uh, very, very valid point. Um, and it's actually been um, scrutinized over the years to the point where now the contracts have become very, very solid. Sadly, at some people's expense over the years and where contracts haven't been as as solid and as well structured, but obviously that's the nature of the industry and that's the nature of learning and growth um, to secure interest. So variations is a very important point. There's a few aspects to it, and I'm going to start with the most important, and that is the size of what you've acquired. Okay. Right? Very, very important. So, again, we'll go back to our example and we'll say it's a 600,000 acquisition for a 60 square metre apartment, right? Um, Well, what happens if when we finish or when we finish the contract and we see the finished product, we find the apartment is 55 metres squared, you know, 52 metres squared. It's not 60. Mm -hmm. How are we protected in that regard? So, the first aspect of it is the general rule across all states at this stage Um, And that general rule I would like to call the 5% variation rule. And the 5% variation rule simply states this. If your property, product or apartment is uh, is varied or reduced by more than 5% of what you've been legally entitled to or um, what you saw initially when you first liked to buy the product, you're legally entitled to walk away and recover 100% of your deposit. No questions asked. So an example would be if a, if a property has been reduced by more than 5.1% of its original size of 60 square metres, then your legal entitlement is, thank you very much, we walk away. You get your deposit back, you get interest terms on that deposit, and so on. Now, that's a privilege, not an obligation. You may turn around and say, well, hold on, the product is great, I love the apartment, it's been built to an amazing quality, it's gone up in value, mm. I've made some money on it. I don't want to pull out, Pete, because I know that even though I can at 5.1%, I want to proceed and I want to go ahead. And that's something, of course, that is your your right and privilege to make that decision, whether to walk away or not. In fact, you could possibly also use it to try and twist the developer's arm a little bit and say, well, Mr. Developer, it's been reduced by 5.1%. I could, if I wish to do so, walk away. I'm not going to. What else can you do to sweeten the deal for me a little bit? So, in short... The 5% variation rule is very important. That's your protection to see that if there is a variation, what right do you have and whether you choose to exercise it or not. And does that only extend to size? I mean, what happens if they change the floor plate Mm. or they change the the dimensions or... The kitchen's not where it's supposed to be or, Mm. you know, what about the other changes? Yeah, very good point. So the contract will actually allude to what changes and variations can and cannot be done and to what extent. Now, the the law does give the developer a little bit of leeway with regards to variations simply to comply with various requirements that the developer may face along the way with local council and other authorities. Where it becomes important is how does such a variation affect number of things. Number one, the overall value of your property. That's a very important determining factor. Will the variation affect the value? Number two, your good use of the property. So I bought the property with the bedroom facing north because I want to get the sunlight. Now my bedroom is facing south. There's an issue there. So these things are determined very clearly in the contract conditions. And if there's a variation as a rule of thumb, depending on how the contract's drafted, that basically affects your value of the property or good use, you generally have certain consequences 
majority of which the ability to pull out of the contract if such a variation exists to that extent. So that's something to be mindful of. Can I, can I just jump in there? So some clients are probably thinking, why would there be any leeway for a developer? Mm. Now, mm. why should they have any uh, leeway for variances? Mm. Um, having worked in the space for a long time, mm. there are sometimes they, they will have, you know, uh, for instance, you know, you, you're going to get melee or equivalent. Yes. Right? Yes. <laughs> or equivalent. Yes. The reason why they do this is because, you know, a certain batch model or type may have gone out of um, it may have already gone out or for the same price they can upgrade it yeah. because it's been two years and now they're ordering a specific stovetop and they can get a better version for the same price so they will generally do that or a type of material or a floorboard there's a slight uh, color change from what it was to what it is now mm. so they can't actually get the specific thing that they had uh, specified that's why they leave a little bit of variance in there. It's not because they want to hurt you or do anything dishonest, mm. but it's more because they want to be able to deliver the best product. That's well, right. Good, good developers, good builders. Yeah, yeah, most definitely. And, and that's a very valid example. Uh, and some variations are imposed on the developer. So that's with regards to white goods and availability. What if um, local councils have to change regulations to the size of a hallway, mm, for example? Fire. I use that a lot because of fire, um, ambulance beds, wheelchair access... Um, disability access and things of that nature. If health regulations insist on that and council has to change certain width of corridors, which is one I use quite often because it's most common, mm. um, the developer will be forced to change the corridor from 1.8 wide to 2.2. And that will cause a variation to the property. So variations are sometimes uh, enforced by external authorities. And if they are, then we get an idea of how we're protected as an investor against such a variation. So the, 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 just to summarise it all, uh, the provisions in place to protect the client are if you know, the value of the property changes mm. or if there's a 5% cha uh, change, um, they have the, the ability to argue or to get out of that contract or at least go back to the developer and ask for a discount or some mm. kind of remuneration. Correct. Correct. Great. We kind of touched on this, mm. um, but vi finishes. You know, mm. How yeah. does a client specifically find out what they're getting and, and what if they change as well. Yeah, and, and again, the contract the contract is essential. I, I think one, one, um, one important topic maybe next time we talk about contracts because that is really the nucleus that summarises everything we're talking about and will govern this whole relationship. The contract is the relationship between you and the developer. So let's talk about how the contract talks about finishes very briefly because we did touch on it. Um, Normally, there's what's called a schedule of finishes or a list of inclusions in all contracts or should be in all contracts, particularly with off-the-plan, uh, that the developer will provide you. And uh, some will be a little bit more detailed than others, but as Dom's touched on, generally they'll say or equivalent to or of like nature or similar, melee or equivalent. And as we said earlier, the reason for that is a perhaps upgrade and better quality for the same price, but also it could be availability. Think of the developer today building a... Uh, 100, 100 unit development that's not going to be ready for two years. They're not going to go buy 100 dishwashers today. That's not no. going to happen. But they will, a few months out of construction, go and buy those. Now, if Melee brand XYZ214 is not available 12 months' time or 18 months' time, they simply will find the equivalent of that. And that's why you find a lot of the times these change. The contract specifies very clearly that if there is a variation to an appliance, it's got to be of equal to or greater than value to what you've been promised in the original schedule of finishes. And a point that arises from that is, well, by whose standard? Because by my standard and Dom's standard could be different to the developer's standard. So equivalent by whose standard? Well, yeah. that's taken out of the equation. It's by industry standard, which is governed by the relevant fair trading department um, in that particular state. So that takes us out of the equation. It's governed by industry standard. In all the years that I've been doing off the plan, if there was one point of concern that I've had the least amount of issues, it's variations to do with appliances. European appliances have come a very long way and their availability to us here in Australia uh, and the price points and quality has become something that wasn't the case 20, 30, 40 years ago. If you remember, if you had a Miele oven or a Miele stove 40 years ago, oh, wow, that's remarkable. Um, a lot of that's changed now. So the developer's accessibility to great quality that are equivalent to what was initially promised is, is there. 
But also the developer has their name attached to it. The developer wants to ensure that they give a good product because they want you to come back and they want their name attached. So in that regard, if they do variations, I've found actually more often than not, they have a greater quality than equal to. So something to consider. Agreed. And then this is the scary part. <laughs> this is the scary question that we cop very, very often. Um, it, it's around defects. Yeah. Uh, I just want to say this. Shit happens. It does, certainly. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we've got contracts. Um, you know, we're dealing with a very big, complex thing, developments. It's not a simple transaction. There's many, many people. There's a lot of trades. There's a lot mm. of moving bodies. There's lots of different regulate. There's, there's a lot of moving parts. Mm. Now, um, for one reason or another, things break or uh, sometimes workmanship isn't quite up to standard. Mm. Uh, sometimes deliberately because they're trying to cut corners, sometimes by accident, sometimes because of timing, whatever the reason, defects do happen. Mm. Um, can we chat a little bit about defects, just um, what they are, uh, you know, can we can we inspect it, mm. who who determines what the defects are, wh what are the time periods, let's just jump yeah. into that. Yeah, most definitely, most definitely. So the exciting part is the project is done, your property is built, it's time to go and have a look and you're like, okay, let's see it. Um, as Dom said, there are a lot of moving parts and there's we're dealing with physical items, brick and mortar. Um, defects are inevitable. What's important is understanding the defects and understanding what our rights are to have them rectified. It's very, very important. So let's make it easy. Let's first of all summarise what are defects. Um, and the best way for you to do that is to put defects in two very distinct categories. What I like to call minor or cosmetic defects and then, of course, on the other side will be major or significant defects. And the difference between the two is rather simple. A minor or a cosmetic defect is anything wrong with the property that doesn't necessarily stop your tenant moving into the property. From a legal perspective, firstly. And secondly, and very importantly, from a safety perspective. So let's use some examples. Um, leaking showers, loose door handles, cracked tiles, cement on windows that hasn't been cleaned properly. Um, hairline cracks. These are called these are defects, and the developer is responsible at their own cost to rectify all defects in the property. What we're going to discuss is how and when is what's important. But firstly, that's what a minor defect is: anything that is wrong with the property that doesn't stop your tenant moving in. Incidental stuff. Incidental stuff that is common in in most, if not all, projects. But then you've got what's called significant and major defects. Now the difference there is rather simple. Anything else that stops your tenant from moving into the property, again, because of a legal or safety issue. So any defect in the property that stops your tenant moving in is classified as a major. Now, how do we deal with them and how does the law protect us in that regard? Firstly, as we said, the developer is responsible to rectify all defects at their own cost. You're buying a brand new product. It's like buying a brand new car and you walk and say, oh, there's a small dent, it's all right. Well, no, it's not all right. It's got to be perfect. Same with your property. But what the law says, it says, okay, if there is a defect that does not necessarily stop your tenant moving in, then the developer, yes, is obligated to rectify it, but they have to come and do so after settlement. Why? Because it's not affecting your hip pocket, so to speak. It's still allowing you to use the product and the property for the purpose that you've got it, and that is to rent it out and get a rental return, but the developer is still obligated to come and rectify that defect after settlement. Yep. Whereas a major defect has very different consequences, you see. A major defect stops your tenant moving in. What does that do to you? Well, it affects your ability to use the property to get your financial return and, of course, pay your mortgage. So as a result, the law protects you and the law doesn't allow the developer to force settlement on you with a major defect. Settlement is delayed. You don't pay anything else to the developer. The developer has to come back and rectify that defect in a workmanlike manner in accordance with Australian building standards and regulations once that's done and inspected, only then do you then proceed to settlement. So that's how defects are looked at. So for, for minor defects, you can't delay settlement. You've got to settle. Correct. If for a major defect, you can delay settlement until it's, it's been completed. 100%. Um, and then after you've settled, mm. how, are the, how much time does a mm. client or developer have to address different defects and, yeah. and how does that process work? That's a very, very good question. And, and it's, been, uh, it's been going on for quite some time about, well, what's the time frame? Now, 
this is going to sound ridiculous, but this is where it is today under the law. So what the law says is in most contracts is the developer has a reasonable time <laughs> to come back and rectify after settlement. Now, look, a reasonable time to a tenant with a leaking shower is yesterday, right? Mm. Whereas a reasonable time to developer could be a few weeks. So the interpretation of that across the board and, and what's acceptable at the moment is this. Within 7 to 14 days of being notified of a defect, the developers, prudent ones in less than 7 days, some within 14 days, will come back and rectify your defect. So do allow a 7 to 14 day period. And um, I think offshoot from that, well, what happens if that doesn't happen? Yep. What happens if they don't do it in time? There is a system that I've implemented in my own properties and... I use it um, all the time. Hopefully, uh, when, you, when you go through the motions, you'll use it less and less. But let me give you an example. What we do is we do a defects report, and I'll discuss that in a moment. The developer gets that report. I like to give the developer 14 days up front with the report. Now, I'm going to use an example of a really bad developer. I give the developer 14 days, say, Mr. Developer, here's my defects. Um, please fix. They don't fix within the 14 days. What I do then is I give a second reminder with an extra seven days. So that now takes us to 21 days. If it's not done after the second reminder, very, very rare. But if, if you are facing one of those situations, then you give a final notice to say we're now going to the relevant Office of Fair Trading with evidence that we've worked with the developer and they haven't responded. And I can guarantee you, when you show the Office of Fair Trading the work that you've done, and your own commitment to chase up. Because if you go to Office of Fair Trading and say, oh, it's been three days, can you please step in? They'll say, no, go and chase it yourself. Yep. So once you do all of that, and if it still hasn't been done, then they'll step in and assist you. Uh, very proud to say in all the developers that we've been working with, with the team, seven to 14 days, it's done. Uh, sometimes even less, and they're far and few in between. But talking about those nightmare situations, that is generally the adopted rule that I like to use um, with, uh, for my clients if they are facing such uh, delays. And that's something that a client would work with you or with the solicitor help manage that process? 100%. 100%. Yeah. We, we like to assist. A lot of people, um, depending on who you've got acting for you, but a lot of people will assume that the conveyancer or solicitor's role ends at settlement. It really doesn't. There's a journey after settlement and we're part of that journey. So we're part of that journey with you. You're not alone. You're not by yourself. Um, we carry that journey with you and if any issues do arise, we're there to help you. And we're there to make sure that we follow the developer. And just on the concept, uh, on the point go with defects, um, well, who inspects? Can we have a look? Well, there's a couple of options. Option one, you can say, Pete, we've just did our first investment. We want to see it's in Melbourne, it's in Queensland. We're going to jump on a plane. We're going to go have a look. We're going to make a weekend of it. Fantastic. In fact, you can say, look, we're very well versed in the building game and we know what we're looking for. So we don't want a defects report. We'll do our own. Right? That's one example. Option two. We have no idea what to look for. Yep. Please get us an independent report, which we do recommend. Um, and that's called a defects report. We go and order a defects report. Mm. They cost or they range anywhere between two to $400, depending on who you use. Yep. That is gold. The defects report we then is provided to the developer to rectify. So some clients say, look, we don't know what we're looking for. And to be honest, this is strictly an investment tool. It's an investment mechanism. We don't even want to have a look. We know it's, we're buying it for no emotion. This is an investment. Get a defects report done. Option three, combination of both. Yep. So we want to see what we've bought. It's our first one. We're really excited, but we don't know what we're looking for. So we're going to go and have a look, but also do a defects report so we to identify what these defects are. So we'll work with you on all of that. And uh, when the time comes, we recommend the time frame of when to do the defects and whether to hire an independent company. <laughs> a lot to take in. Yeah, that's exhaustive. Um, Peter, you've covered everything. I mean, I mean there's, there's, there's a hell of a lot more we could talk about, but sure. you know, in this off the plan space, I feel like you've addressed all of the main issues that, that, that the commonly asked questions. Yeah. So I want to say thank you very much for taking this time and, and, and sitting with us and going through in a great level of detail all of this. Um, I do want to say that Peter is one of our preferred uh, partners and, and conveyances because of his breadth of knowledge and you can see for yourself or hear for yourself um, how much detail he's gone into the experience and how many contracts he's worked on, but not just him, his team. So I, I do want to extend to everybody out there, uh, if you have any further questions that you want to ask myself 
or Peter, please send them through to us. We can then fire them down the line, invite Peter back on the sure. show, and we can address the more advanced questions at that point in time. And I want to say thank you to you for all the work you've been doing for all of our clients, for us personally, um, and for your for your time today. My absolute pleasure. Thank you for the opportunity. I've had a, I've had a ball. Um, love property, love conveyancing, and uh, happy to come anytime. Thanks thank for the you. pleasure. Thank you. Thank you to all of you listening. If you enjoyed today's show, leave a like, a comment, share it with all your friends and um, we hope to see you all soon. Bye.